1 Thessalonians chapter 2 this afternoon in the New Testament, book 1 Thessalonians. It's right after the book of Colossians, so if you find Galatians or Ephesians there, move a little bit forward and you'll get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to read, starting in verse number 1, and read down through verse number 16. And this will have a connection with the message from last week, and actually the message I'm preparing for next Sunday, again, will be kind of a connected theme regarding preaching, preachers, and and that. So uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and again, we'll talk about preachers and and teachers and that today, but I'd, I'd like us, especially as we get to the end of the message, to focus more on our responsibility, and we did talk about that last week a bit, our responsibility, because there are false teachers, we have a responsibility to then search the scriptures ourselves, right, to be responsible, to make sure what we're hearing is the truth, to know what the truth is, and uh, so today we're going to kind of continue with that theme. In First Thessalonians 2, starting in verse number 1, for yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. That is, there was people contending against him. He's not saying that he was speaking with contention, right? That's not Paul here, you know, well, I want to have an argue with you, you know, he's speaking. He says, no, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And there's always kind of that voice against the truth. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. In contrast, last week we talked about these false teachers who used deceit. Verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Again, we'll talk about this idea today. Uh, the truth isn't always comfortable, right? And, and Paul is saying, look, we, there was contention against us, but as we spoke, we were speaking the truth and we didn't try to make it sound good, right? Palatable, sometimes we say, make something palatable. Uh, and we have kind of that going on in society today, right? Well, this truth is uncomfortable, so let's just change it a little so that it's a little bit more attractive. But once you change the truth to make it more acceptable, it's no longer the truth, right? And we, we understand this when somebody comes to us speaking flattering words, what do we typically do? We're, we're kind of on guard, like, why are you being so nice? And sometimes it's kind of a joke in a home, you know, like a daughter coming to, dad, you know how much I love you and hugging him and all. And, and, and what's the, you see that in, in books and in sitcoms and all that, right? It, immediately, what's the response of the dad? What do you want? You know, and how much is it going to cost me? Right? That's the, this kind of, you know, when the, all that, dad, you're the greatest dad ever. And it, okay, you know, you want something or, or, you know, if they're a little bit older, what did you do that you don't want me to be upset about, right? You know, that big scratch on the side of the car, dad, I don't know how it got there, right? Um, as a matter of fact, there was a radio program years ago, and it's one of the funniest calls. It was a call-in radio show for auto uh, like help. They would call into the show, I'm having this problem with my car, and the guys were very amusing. And there was a girl that called up and was telling this story of driving her dad's car several hours away for some party he didn't know she was going to and all this. And you know that little check oil light that comes on that's very important and that you should stop immediately. She it came on and she it was bothering her. So she put a piece of black tape over it so that she could keep driving. And her dad didn't know that the tape had been put over there and all that. Anyway, it wrecked the engine. And so she called in. She said, you know, I've been thinking about this. And I'm wondering, was I responsible for the death of the car? And uh, of course, they said, yes, you are. And I forget how it all panned out, but they got her dad on the phone while she's on the phone and had and immediately hi, daddy, I love you. You know, it, it, I mean, it's such an amusing call. And, and of course, these two guys hosting the show are just 
building it up and start, you know, do you remember such and such car that you had? And that, you know, that, did you have some engine trouble? And all? It, it was very amusing, but it, the funniest to me was her, hi daddy, I love you, you're the greatest and all, before the truth of this comes out. We all understand that idea of flattering words, right? And that, well, that might be a joke and there is love within the family, when some stranger starts speaking to us with flattering words, what, right? We're on guard. Like, what, what does this guy want or what's he trying to sell me? You know, you go into a store with suits or shirts and dresses and all that. And they're like, oh, yes, you look lovely in this. Oh, that's definitely your color. And, and it really, you know, this and that. And, you know, what are they trying to do? Sell you the dress or the suit or whatever. Neither at any time used we flattering words. Paul said, look, that's not how we came, right? We, we weren't trying to make this attractive to you. We just wanted to speak the truth. Verse six, nor have men sought we glory, right? So he's not trying to get uh, this to be famous. He, he's not looking for anything. He said, nor have men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others. When we might have been burdensome, here he's talking about even that he could have asked them, even to support him, he said, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. Again, this idea of demanding support out of you and anything. He said, we preached unto you the gospel of God. That was our goal. That was our desire. Ye are witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Last week, we talked about false teachers, right? And we saw, and we're looking even at some of those texts again today, that there were going to be false teachers in the world. And those false teachers, you know, because of covetousness, you know, looking to gain or whatever, they are the ones that speak with the flattering words, right? They're, they're the ones that, look, they don't want you to go away upset, right? They want you to open up your wallet, open up your purse and, and give. And so they're going to tell you what you want to hear, right? But that's not a good teacher, right? A, a good teacher lets you know, when you got something wrong, right? I mean, that's this kind of normal as we stop and think about that, right? I mean, what kind of a test would it be at school if you took a test and no matter what you answered, you know, you got 100%. You wouldn't learn anything from that. You don't know what you're missing, right? And if the teacher marks several things wrong, like maybe you only got half, you got a 50%. It shows you that you don't know the material, right? A good teacher is going to say, you know, I'm not saying that they say it harshly or unkindly, but at the same time, they're going to say, you need to work on this, right? They, they're going to come to you and show you the truth. I mean, there, there are certain things where if you don't know the truth and you don't understand, right, it'll be dangerous. It, you could end up hurting yourself or hurting others. I, I was um, watching a video the other day in YouTube, a guy uh, showing and talking about 
a dangerous trend that people are learning from the internet and not realizing how dangerous it is, uh, you can make some really cool fractal patterns in wood, like burn them in. If you put a salt solution on the wood and then put an electric charge through the wood because then the electrons go shooting all over and it burns a very pretty pattern. Now there are safe ways to do it. I mean, it's still electricity, right? You have to pay attention and do things right. There are some safe ways to do it, but it's not as fast and you don't get as deep a burn and all. What's being suggested on the internet is find an old microwave, take the microwave apart and pull the transformer out of the microwave and wire up to this transformer. Without going into details and all that, there are people that are dying because they're not understanding how dangerous that is and uh, it has to do with how electricity flows and works and the fact that even GFI breakers aren't going to save you and, and people are just basically getting cooked, unable to let go of the electrodes because of the way that transformer works. This guy is trying to do a service to people saying, look, this is dangerous and here's why. Right? He's not trying to be mean. He's not trying to spoil the fun. He's saying, look, this is, this is dangerous. And, and Paul is talking here about, you know, we looked last week at the words of Paul saying there's going to be these false teachers and they're going to come in and, and they're going to be like wolves. And Jesus talks about them, wolves in sheep's clothing, right? They, they kind of hide themselves and they don't care about the sheep, right? A wolf amongst the sheep does not care about the betterment of the sheep, the life of the sheep, how long they're going to live, how well they're going to live. He doesn't care where they eat other than... He'd like them to be a little fatter when he eats them, right? That's, that's all, right? That's all the wolf cares about, you know? He cares about how tasty will this sheep be and how easy will it be for me to eat it? And Paul said, look, we didn't come in like these others. We weren't with the flattering words, right? We, we didn't say all these things that you wanted to hear and that we simply preached the gospel of God. And Last week, we talked about the false teachers, and, and I, I wanted to then kind of this week give a balance on the other side because it, I was worried even that it came across like all teachers are false, and that's not the impression I was trying to give. There are good teachers, and what Paul shows here are some of the characteristics of a true teacher of God's word. See, the, the false teachers are looking to gain something for themselves, right? They, they want to have greatness. They want, as Paul said, nor, nor of men sought we glory, right? They want that glory. They, they want people to look to them. They want to appear wise, the educated, learned, people that, to praise their name. And so they'll say things that are gonna make you feel good, make you like them. Right? I remember my parents growing up saying things like that, you know? We love you, but our goal is not to be your friend, right? Like, you know, it's, it's not that I'm not friends with my parents and, and we didn't have a good relationship, but there was a difference, right? They're not my buddy. And just, you know, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go do it together. No, no, no. What were they striving to do? To educate me, to put me in the right direction, to direct me, to warn me about the dangers in life and those things. They didn't always tell me flattering things. As a matter of fact, my father often said many non-flattering things. Uh, <clears throat> I, I heard regularly growing up, uh, he would call me worm brain. And not just me, my sister, my mom, I mean, everybody was worm brain. Uh, when you would do something dumb, he's like, what are you doing, worm brain? And uh, <clears throat> it, 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 it is stuck in my head, and I say it sometimes to people, like, what are you doing, worm brain? Uh, or I at least think it, like, what a worm brain. Uh, <laughs> because my dad would say that. Now, why did my dad say that? Because I was doing something dumb, right? It, you know, something that somebody that has a brain the size of a worm would do. My dad didn't always say flattering things. He didn't use flattering words because he cared for me. 
right? He would tell me I was wrong. He wanted me to learn. He wanted me to be, you know, a, a good man, a, a respectable person in society, right? Which meant he had to tell me I was wrong sometimes, and Paul's talking about that. Not all teachers are false teachers, but there's kind of this great gulf between the two when we talk about their character. Whenever somebody tells you things that are only pleasant to hear, there's a good chance they're lying to you. There's a good chance they're a deceiver. There's a good chance that they're just using you, right? Because a true friend, and the Bible talks about that, you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. We read that in the Old Testament. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That, that sounds a little counterintuitive. Like, why would my friend wound me? But see, a true friend really will, right? A true friend says, no, 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 don't do that. Look, you, you were wrong to it. Actually, even you know, after the fact, right? Hey, man, you need to apologize for that. It, it was wrong that you did this. You know, you hurt that person or this, right? That's a true friend. A true friend speaks honestly, for our benefit, to, to help us be better. And Paul is, is showing us that contrast. In verse number eight, notice the contrast he shows us. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. One of the things that I see Paul explaining there is just that willingness to give of himself, to make a sacrifice of himself for their benefit. And we can contrast that with what we read in 2 Peter last week, if you want to turn over there, in 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm sorry, chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2. There were, Peter's talking about these false prophets and teachers in 2 Peter chapter 2, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily, we talked about that kind of secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, their damnation slumbereth not. But do you see the drastic difference there? Paul said... You know, if you, you kind of flip back. We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. Right? And he said in verse 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others. What does Peter talk about these false teachers? And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. There's a big difference between giving myself to you and making merchandise of you. Because giving myself to you means sacrificing that which I have for your benefit. Making merchandise of you is sacrificing you for my benefit. They're, they're, they're just completely opposite of each other. And so there are false teachers in the world, but we have to understand that there are good teachers. And Paul is giving us now in 1 Thessalonians an example of what these good teachers are. In John chapter 10, kind of keeping with this theme, right? they're making merchandise of you. Jesus talks about good shepherds. In this passage, he, present, he shows us how he is the good shepherd. But he talks about the difference between a shepherd and a hireling. In John chapter 10, verse 12, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. So if you can kind of picture this, right? This idea of a shepherd out there with the, with the flock and the wolf comes along. When the shepherd is the owner of the sheep, when they're his sheep, the level of care he shows is much greater, right? He doesn't run away when the wolf comes. Right? The shepherd will 
go out and attack the wolf, right? He'll, he'll give his life for the sheep, Jesus talks about in this passage. Yeah. There's a good example of that in the Old Testament with the King David when he was a shepherd, right, before he was king. He tells the story of, you know, a lion came and I slew the lion. A bear came and I slew the bear, right? He, he Why? Because they were his sheep. He had the responsibility to care for them. And so he said, okay, there's a bear coming. There's a lion coming. I'm not going to run off. I have to protect these sheep. And so I'm going to put myself in the line of danger for their sake. Whereas the hireling, who is just doing it to get a paycheck, right? This is my paycheck. This is my job. But man, I'm not getting hurt for this. When that, that hireling, then when the wolf comes, says, that's the sheep's problem. That, that's, you know, owner of the sheep, sorry, you, you had a loss today. The wolf showed up. But you don't, expect, you don't, you don't pay me enough to put myself out there. Right? He's just an employee. He, he doesn't, in a sense, care about the company. He doesn't care about the stock or anything. He's just earning a paycheck, but he's not going to put himself in danger. Paul said, I'm not preaching as a hireling. And I'm, I, as a matter of fact, he said multiple times, I didn't do this to get gain. Even when I had a right, you know, based on Scripture, based on, on what Christ said, the fact that I'm an apostle, I, I had the right to actually ask you to support me because I didn't want to be a stumbling block, because I didn't want somebody to, to make that accusation, which is often levied against preachers. Yeah, all they care about is money. All they talk about is money. Money, 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 money. I almost never preach about money. As a matter of fact, that years ago, the church I pastored, there was one Sunday where I did preach about money, and it was in the text and in our reading and everything. And uh, I kind of laughed about it because there was a family who was there, and they had invited a guest, and that guest came. They had no idea what I was going to preach, and I didn't know the guest was going to be there or anything. And they were they had this look on their face when I, I said, we're going to talk about money today. And they thought, oh, man, we've been telling these people, like, it's different here. They never talk about money. And sure enough, the day we bring the guest, he's going to talk about money. But that was one time out of, I don't know, a couple of years that, I, that we talked about it. Because the Bible talks about those things. But Paul said, look, I understand that accusation, right? He said, I, I didn't want somebody to say, oh, you're just after money. That's why you're doing this. He said, so even when I could have, I didn't. Contrast that with the false teacher. Uh, honestly, if there is somebody who is always preaching about money, uh, there's a good sign that they probably are a false teacher. And Paul here, again, is giving us that contrast when he says, look, we didn't come in speaking flattering words. I, I came in, right, he said, gentle as a nurse cherisheth her children, right? And we saw later where he said, as a father cares for his children, right? Think about that example, a father that cares for their child. Um, how much income is a father hoping to gain from their child? And in, in, in that's kind of motivating their care for them, right? Like, you know, what's the, what's the bill? Right? I'm sure, John, you, you've, you've not given your daughters a bill yet to this point. Maybe you're thinking about it, but right? There's, there hasn't, I'm sure you've considered it. Like, man, they're getting pretty expensive as they get older, you know? Electrical yeah, the electrical, yeah. I'm, the long hair, just the hair dryer itself is just, yeah, it's, Taken out. At least you don't have sons, right? I, some of my friends with sons have talked about that. Like, man, I, I needed like a second job just to feed this teenage boy, um, right? You, but right, your the parents don't. Well, here's the bill. I mean, I did care for you, so pay up. No, why does a parent care for their child? 
because it's natural affection. It's normal, right? A, a father will give himself for his children, asking nothing in return, because that's what a father does, right? It's, it's motivated out of love. The father says, I want for you to have it better than I did, right? I want you to do better than I did. I want you to avoid the mistakes I made, right? That's, that's a father. And Paul says that's kind of uses that as the example of this is how we were, right? We weren't looking to gain from you. As a matter of fact, we wanted you to be better off, right? We, a true teacher actually hurts when the sheep go astray. Right? The, the false teacher is just looking to gain, but the true teacher cares about the individual sheep, knows them, and it's a burden for him when a sheep goes astray. In, in Hebrews chapter 13, at the same time, right, it's great joy to the true teacher when he sees the sheep following in the right foot. Hebrews chapter 13, towards the end of the New Testament. Verse number seven. Here in the context, he's talking about those that are teachers that God has put in that position as a pastor. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. So right there, it's clear. That's what he's talking about, right? Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversations. This is Hebrews 13, verse 7. And I do want to explain that word conversation a little bit because we use it differently today than when this was written. Uh, today, generally, when we say conversation, we mean words that are being said. But the older meaning of conversation related to all that we do, not just what we say. You know, that, that phrase of picture is worth more than a thousand words. The idea is that the way I live is a conversation. My conversation is not just in the words that I say, but the things that I do, how I behave, how I act towards you, right? Because my actions do speak to you. We have this phrase in English, right? Actions speak louder than words. Well, Wait, they sp my actions speak? Yes, it's conversation. And that's what here the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Remember them which have the rule over you, spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation, as you have seen their example, right? Follow in that example, because they've been true to you in teaching you the word of God. If you skip down to verse 17 in the same chapter, obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, why? For they watch for your souls as they that must give account. So a true teacher remembers that. A true pastor, a true teacher of God's word remembers that I, I'm going to have to give an account for the things that I've taught, for the things that I've done, how I have acted. And they watch for your souls, right? That they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you, right? A, a true teacher rejoices when the sheep are following in the right path. And they sorrow, they hurt when it's the other way around, when the sheep don't follow, when they go astray. So the, the hireling runs when the wolf comes. The true shepherd goes up against the wolf to protect the sheep because it's as if they're his own. Right? He, he's, he's not just collecting a paycheck. He's caring for those individuals. We read, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago in 2 John and 3 John, where it uh, talked about walking in truth. And John said, John the Apostle said, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walking in the truth. Just like it's a sorrow when they don't. He said, I rejoice. I don't have any greater joy than that, than to see that you're following in the truth. Because really, as I said, that the tr true teacher of God's word, that's the desire to impart the truth of God's word and to encourage you to live by it. The false teacher has flattering words and is just looking to gain. 
they care, a true teacher cares like a father for a child. So then going back to 1 Thessalonians, this is where, as I said, I, I wanted us to kind of get to today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. There's the contrast between the false teacher and the true, true teacher. <clears throat> but as I said, last week we talked about our responsibility based on the fact that there's false teachers. We had a responsibility to search the scriptures to see if these things are so, right? To know the Bible ourselves. I want to again this week look at what's our responsibility? What should our reaction be? When we hear the word of God being taught by a true teacher, someone who does care for our soul, right? Who's not just looking to win from us, who's not just telling us what we want to hear, right? Who's sometimes saying things that we're not really comfortable with, that we don't like that they are saying. But it's the truth of God's word and we can't argue with it. We're like, I don't like that he said that, but okay, it's the truth. I have a friend that's a, a preacher in the United States, and uh, and he likes to say things that aren't easy to take, and and uh, but he wants to be a help, so he preaches the truth. But he he always says, "Now look, I'm I'm going to stab you right now, but I'm going to do it with a smile, so you can't be mad." And and he would smile, and then he said, "Now look, I know." This might hurt some of you because it hurts me when I hear this, but this is what God said. But I'm smiling so you can't be mad. And he does try to soften the blow a little bit, but at the same time, right, the truth is true. Sometimes you say the truth hurts. Uh, you know, if, if you've ever seen some of the clips of people that have tried out for those singing television shows and all that who cannot, you know, couldn't carry a tune in a paper bag, right? They, they just can't sing. And they're convinced, like my mom has told me for years that I'm the greatest singer she's ever heard. Mama probably did you a disservice. Mama probably needed to say, honey, no, singing's not for you, right? I mean, sometimes we need to be told that. Like this is, this is not for you. You, you just can't. And in light of that, what should be our reaction when a true teacher stands up with God's word and speaks to us? And we see that in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, For this also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Paul said, here's the greatest, this is the thing I'm the most thankful for, right? He said, we, we give thanks to God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. What, what does that mean? What does it mean that you receive, receive the word of God, not as the word of men, but as it is from God? Well, if you think about this, what does it mean to receive it as it's from a man? People say these kind of things. That's your opinion, right? That's the idea of receiving it as the word of man. Well, that's your opinion, right? That's what you think about this. That's, that's how you want to act, and that's great, but I just think differently, right? I just have a different opinion. I just... So if we look at the Bible as if it came from a man, that's what we're going to say. We're going to say, well, I've heard this many times, right? I know the Bible says, but. Well, as soon as you say that, you're on the pathway to saying it's, it's just opinion, right? Because, you know, in, in America, at least, we have the phrase, I, I don't know if it's made its way up there to Canada with you folks, but right? opinions are like noses. Everyone has one and all of them smell. It's just 
opinion, right? When it's just man, it's opinion. That's your opinion. That's how you feel about that. As soon as we say it's just from man, now there's room for doubt. There's room to say, well, that's your interpretation or that's how how you view this thing. And, And once we start to have that doubt, right? Whether it's towards a preacher, something we read in scripture and we say, well, well, that's maybe that's not exactly how God thought about it. You know, that was just how it was written down. That's just how Luke interpreted it. That's just how Paul thought about it. That's just their opinion. That's just your opinion. That's just the opinion of that pastor. That's just what he thinks about that. As soon as we think it comes from man, what happens? We become the authority. Really, any time in a conversation where we say something to that effect of, that's your opinion, we're we're actually appealing to a different authority. Then We're saying, I have a different experience or knowledge or whatever. And it may be that something is just someone's opinion, right? And sometimes we speak that way. This is my opinion. This is what I think about that. If we say that, what are we saying? We're saying, this is not authoritative, right? It's how I think about it. And it's how I'm acting upon it. You make your own decision, right? We're kind of, We're opening that door and saying, look, I'm not sure about this. But there's a difference when we're speaking about fact, right? Then fact is fact and the fact is the authority, right? It's it's not just my opinion that you can't breathe water. And I'm not even encouraging you to attempt it. Right here, your your body is not going to change itself once you struggle to breathe underwater. No, it's a fact, right? It's not my opinion. I mean, you could say it is my opinion that you can't breathe water. That's true. But my opinion is based on the fact that you can't, that your lung system is not designed to draw oxygen, you know, out of the the free floating oxygen molecules out of the water. Your, Your body does not do that. You will die. Fact. I'm not being cruel by telling you not to try. But if you decide, ah, that's your opinion. As soon as you say that, you have some doubt, right? That was Eve talking with Satan in the garden. What did Satan do? He said, well, God didn't really say that. And Eve started to think about that and decided that she was the authority and not what God had said. That her opinion or that the idea that, oh, God said that thing because he is keeping something from me, right? That was Satan's temptation, really. There's something God is keeping from you. And now all of a sudden, ah, so that really wasn't true. It wasn't really for my benefit. It's actually to hinder me because God is somehow cruel and trying to keep me from something. And all of a sudden now, Eve is receiving God's word as if it's man's opinion. And it led to disaster. And Paul is saying, look, I'm rejoicing that when we came and we preached the gospel unto you, You didn't receive it as if it was just words from man. You see, we act different. If we think it's just an opinion versus fact from God. We just have a different reaction to that. If it's just man's opinion, we might look at it and examine it and say, well, maybe that would make my life better. You know, I'll give it a try. See see how it goes, you know. You've come to this conclusion. It seems to be working for you. I'll give it a shot. But when we say, oh no, this is something that 
God Almighty, the omnipotent, the omniscient God, the creator of everything, this is something he said. Well, now it's not just something to try, right? It's fact. It's what he wants. And if we receive it that way, right, we react differently. And this ended up showing forth in the life of the Thessalonians as Paul continued to write about it. As he said, you know, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. Right? God's word won't have an effect if, if we actually don't believe it. If we just think it's opinion. But he continues, for ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. What's he talking about there? Well, their belief in this truth that was preached to them, they believed as if God himself had spoken to them. That's really how they received it. That it wasn't really Paul speaking, it was God speaking. And because they received it that way, they were willing to suffer persecution over that. Right? We're, we're not going to suffer persecution to hold to somebody else's opinion. Like that's, that's never going to work, right? Following somebody else's opinion and somebody comes along and says, look, believe my opinion or die. Okay, I'll believe your opinion. Because it's just an opinion, right? What, what does it matter? When we say this is what God said, whether I suffer persecution or not, I must follow it. It's completely different. James chapter 1, we'll just kind of close out with another passage here. Ultimately, we could say this comes down to whether we believe this word is from God or not. But it was evidenced in the Thessalonians. It had an effect. When we receive the word of God as if it's from God, it changes us. If we look at it as coming from man, then anytime we're not in agreement with it, we'll say, well, that's just the opinion. And that's, that's the easy way out, right? Ah, oh, that's just your opinion, so I don't have to follow it. James chapter 1, verse 21, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. He's talking about God's word there. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Receive with meekness the engrafted word. That is, humbly come to this word and say, okay, the thing that I'm hearing from this true teacher is really God speaking to me. It's not the teacher's opinion. It's what the Bible says. It's what God says. And if I'll receive that, it'll have an effect in my life. But if I receive it like the word of man, it's just an opinion. And ultimately that is kind of the question that I want to leave us with today to ponder think about, to mull over. How do I receive the word? When I read it, when I hear it preach, am I, am I receiving it as if God himself is speaking to me? Or am I taking it as just the word of man? It's, it's just what he Because it's not going to have the effect in our life that God intends. If I look at it as just another man's opinion. Just some good ancient advice. How do I receive God's word? How are we receiving? Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for your word today. For the privilege once again to gather together to open up your word and spend some time studying these things, Lord. Please help us through the week, Lord, to be doers of the word, not hearers only, as we just read, Lord, that we would receive your word 
exactly is that, as word that came from you, Lord, of you speaking to us. Lord, please protect us from ever starting to think that our opinion is more important or that keep us from ever looking to your word as if it's just the word of man written down with some some nice advice, but just an opinion. Lord, that we would remember this comes from you, the almighty God. Lord, please help us, Father, to be, again, doers of your word, Lord, even as we go through this week. Guide and direct our steps, Lord. Help us to live lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.